Good morning, church. It's a pleasure to have each and every one of you with us this morning. My name is Tim Bedall, and I serve as lead pastor here at the church. And it's our pleasure, pleasure to open up God's Word this morning. I'm going to ask you to turn uh, in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, grab that pew Bible in the pew rack in front of you where you can find our passage on page uh, 917, 16 and 17. And for those who haven't been with us, we've been in a journey going through the book of Acts written by a man named Luke. He's writing this story to tell people uh, of the history and the times of the early church. And he's telling us about the times after Jesus' earthly ministry and after his death, burial, and resurrection and subsequent ascension back into heaven. And the question is, what would God's people do after Christ had left the scene? And we have been learning that they have been fulfilling the commands and commission of God of what Jesus had given them in the Great Commission. They were able to check off a couple things off of that Great Commission. Remember when Jesus was about to leave his disciples, he said, I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And they'd be able to say, Jerusalem, check. Tens of thousands of people had come to know Jesus in Jerusalem. Judea, the countryside, they had seen large numbers of disciples come to know Jesus and and put and commit their lives to Jesus in that way. And so they could check that off the list. But then it was Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world that were still left. Up to this point, the church has experienced a great deal of peace and productivity in ministry. That is until the passage that we looked at last week. Stephen, who was a a disciple of Jesus Christ, not one of the apostles, was out preaching and teaching in Jerusalem, and people began to not like what they heard. As he preached and proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ, and he did so boldly, the religious establishment said, we don't want to hear anything more. And becoming so angry, they picked up stones and began to stone him, eventually killing him. And we learned that as a result of that, the church no longer had its special status within the city of Jerusalem. No more would people be in awe and respect and revere the people of Christ and the way of Christianity. Now the church was going to become public enemy number one. And this morning as we look at the text, I want to do so under the heading, When God Throws a Curveball. Well, what are you going to do when you are surprised by what God may be calling you into. And we're going to see how the church responds to a couple different curveballs that come the church's way. And we are going to learn, because we will experience curveballs too, when they come, how are we to respond when our comfort zones are taken away from us? Let's look to our text, and then I'm going to ask for God's blessing on our time. We'll jump right in to our message this morning. It tells us at the beginning of chapter 8, And there arose on that day, what day? The day that Stephen was stoned, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered, that is the disciples, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. They stay in Jerusalem. Okay, And then we are told in verse 2, Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul... The Saul that we learned about last week who oversaw the death of Stephen. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Now we're going to fast forward to verse 26, and we're going to pick up verse 9 next week, but let's follow Philip again. And it says in verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. 
He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Let's just go ahead and stop there, and we'll pick up the story in a couple moments, but let's pray. Father God, we come before you, and we thank you for what you have done in our services already. Lord, what a joy to see five individuals uh, dedicate themselves and commit themselves to the cause of Christ in the waters of baptism. We thank you for the life change that that signifies. Lord, we are amazed that now in this last year we have seen almost 50 people uh, dedicate themselves to obedient steps of baptism here at this campus alone. Thank you for what you're doing in our midst and that you are showing us some of the very things that was seen in the early church. We're so thankful for it. Now, Lord, as we open up your word, and as we learn that sometimes you surprise us with things, sometimes you, you call us to ministries, call us to people that maybe we never thought we would be reaching, Lord, I pray that we would be ready and able to receive your word and be available and obedient to your calling when you call us to a specific task. Now, Lord, I pray that you would speak through me and you would use me in a powerful way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In 1967, Hollywood would throw the country of America a curveball. In the summer of 1967, the news uh, that was going around was what was the Supreme Court going to do on a court case that had the United States mesmerized. It had only been four years since uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would announce from the steps of the Abraham Lincoln Memorial that he had a dream. But in 1967, the question before the Supreme Court was, is it lawful for a black man to marry a white woman? Was it lawful for a white woman to marry a, or a white uh, man to marry a black woman? You see, the issue was interracial marriage. And for some of us, we're like, that's so foreign to us. Of course, they should be able to do so. But in that day, 17 states here in America still said it was illegal or unlawful for that type of union to take place. And Hollywood wanted to speak about it. Hollywood wanted to uh, announce to the world that this, in fact, was lawful and right. So in the summer of 1967, what became one of the leading movies of the day was a movie that would talk about what it is to be thrown a curveball. In the movie, guess who's coming to dinner? Many of you probably are aware of it. Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn play uh, two socialite progressives in San Francisco. They have a daughter, a blonde, beautiful young lady who has just gone on a trip to Hawaii. And she comes back and she tells her parents that she's got great news. I can't wait to see you at home. I've had the time of my life and I can't wait to tell you what's, what's happened. Well, little do they know that their lives are going to be shocked. Now, remember, these are li liberal-leaning, progressive thinking, uh, anything-goes types of parents. They laud themselves on being okay with things that the world seemingly is not. That is until when they meet the man that she met in Hawaii. Now, what would be a whirlwind romance already would add greater shock when Sidney Poitier would walk into their house and she would introduce this doctor friend not only as an acquaintance or a friend, not even as just a boyfriend, but as two who are engaged to be married. For the next couple moments in the movie, these progressive, open-minded people have something very real take place. You see, within them, there was dormant racism, bigotry, prejudice. And they hadn't told anybody. And they hadn't shared it with anybody. In fact, they had been awarded awards as socialites of being people who were forward-thinking. But now, standing before him, before them was a gentleman who was going to rock every thought that they had about their own racism and bigotry. Now, the producers of the movie make the character that Sidney Poitier uh, portrays as a guy who is great in every way. He is good-looking, he is intelligent, he is a doctor who has written all kinds of incredible literature to help people all over the world. He's a pure man. He even tells them when, when the mom asks the daughter, you know, is there some uh, funny business going on? She says, no, it's not because of me. He won't do it until we're married. 
And so this guy is painted in the perfect picture, and yet he is still in the first part of the movie rejected because of one thing, he was black. And what Hollywood was telling America was, listen, we got to get over this racism thing. We've got to get over it. And what you learn in the movie is that when you are thrown a curveball, when something happens that you weren't expecting, the real you comes out. You don't get a chance to act it out. You don't get to portray something you're not. The real you with the real feelings and the real emotions come out. And we see that no longer are they acting, but the real person comes out. They don't like black people. And what may be okay from afar surely would not be where they would share their holidays and their grandchildren together with a black man. In 1967, the vote would go, and the Supreme Court would knock it down. And judicial scholars would say, not only was it a law that was made at the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C., but they credit this very movie as being the thing that turned the culture around. Now, remakes usually don't do as well as the original, but I'm here to tell you I've seen both of them. The 2005 remake with Bernie Mac and Ashton Kutcher does a pretty good job, except they turn the tables. And instead of being a white family having to accept a black uh, individual into their family, the producers of Guess Who in 2005 change it with a very well-to-do black family who is shocked, who is shocked to find out that their daughter is marrying a white man and dealing with, even in 2005, the racism and the bigotry that, listen, happens on both sides. You see, when you are thrown a curveball, in both of these scenarios, they highlight the dad in both scenarios, and both of the men have to allow the real them to come out. No longer faking, no longer portraying the real them came out. And that is true for us in our lives. When we are shocked with a story, when we are uh, placed in a position that we did not think was going to happen, when we are taken out of our comfort zone by God himself, the real us comes out. Are we going to complain? Are we going to murmur? Are we going to grumble? Or are we going to praise God? You see, the early church had a line in the sand. They had been enjoying for some time the, the blessing of being God's people. They were enjoying the fellowship and the community that they were experiencing within the church. People outside of the church revered them and respected them. They were in awe of what was taking place. That is, until that day, Stephen was killed. And on that day, we are told, great persecution breaks out in Jerusalem. And gone were the days of people acknowledging the good you were doing. As I said before, the church had become public enemy number one. And the question for the church was, how were they going to respond now that God had thrown them a curveball? Were they going to remain committed? Were they going to remain uh, as uh, committed to the cause? Or were they just going to take their stuff and head home? Today we're going to learn from Philip, especially, and the church from afar, and see that they remain committed and true. And the question is, when God throws a curveball, how will we respond? There are three things I want you to see this morning. And for you who are in this flight with me from your cockpit, I want you to know the first point's really long, the second point really short, and the third point really, really short. And so you're gonna, we're going to hit our, our, our soaring altitude of 30,000 feet, and then I'm going to bring this thing to a crashing halt. So buckle your seatbelts, and let's see what God's going to do. First point this morning, when God throws you a curveball, usually, usually, usually it means your life's going to be full of surprises. It's going to come full of surprises. I can't imagine that the early church thought persecution is on the horizon. I don't think that Stephen got up that morning and said, you know what, today's the day I'm going to die. But that's exactly what happened. And we pick up where Luke ha has led us off at, at the end of chapter 7. And there arose on that day of Stephen's uh, death a great persecution against the church. Now let's stop there. And right away we hear persecution and we put ourselves in, uh, we, sorry, we put the church in our lives. And we say, oh yeah, I've been persecuted. Listen, what, what, what's being talked about here is not being uh, made the butt of a joke because of our religious 
convictions. It isn't that we don't get to sit at the popular kids' table in the high school. It isn't that uh, people call us kooks or Bible thumpers or any number of, uh, of names that they come up with. We are told in the text what happens. Notice in, in verse uh, 2, after devout men bury Stephen and make great lamentations for him, the same Saul who had overseen the death of Stephen is now ravaging the church. That word ravaging in the Greek is literally a, an animal, a wild animal that is ripping apart the flesh of its prey. And so Paul, Saul has gone out and he's ripping apart the lives of Christians. How is he doing it? Notice in the text. Entering house after house, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. So if, if Saul came to your house, he did not knock on the door, he banged open the door, knocked it down, and grabbed you because of one issue in your life. That is that you had been identified as a Christian. None of that is happening to us today. And then you were dragged off and put into prison. That meant when you were put into prison in the first century, you probably lost your job and your income. You probably lost all of your possessions. And you probably lost any standing you had within the world you lived in. And during that time, you could be held for any amount of time. They didn't have to tell you how long. They didn't have to give you a sentence. You could have been left for dead in the prison. And so this is great persecution. This is great calamity. And the question we have to ask this morning when it comes to God's curveball, because they didn't see this coming. The church, no doubt, had no idea that this was going to take place. The question we have to ask is, the first question we always have to ask when surprises and curveballs come our way is, why, why are we called to suffer? This church that had done so good, who had been serving in so many great ways, this church that had seen thousands upon thousands of people come to know Jesus, this church that had boldly proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ, this church that had seen hundreds if not thousands of people healed from illnesses and diseases, exercised from demons, this church that did a really, really good job of making sure the needs of their community were taken care of. People were selling their possessions and their goods and giving to all those in need. Uh, this church that made sure that the widows were cared for. This church that showed unconditional love to one another that was doing it right. This church that was obediently following God God saw fit to bring trouble and turmoil into their life. Why? What good is it for Christ's followers to experience suffering? I want you to know that I have no answer for you as to the why. I don't know. In fact, uh, this week, I, I was uh, renewed in my questioning of God in this way. Uh, many of you know our, our uh, uh, missionary from New Guinea, Ben and, and Missy Hatton. And my connection with Ben and Missy Hatton goes back to my college days. And I got connected with Ben and Missy Hatton in the island of New Guinea through an international man who had uh, been a missionary friend of uh, some missionaries here in the Fox Valley area. His, my friend's name was Bezo Sagavo. He was from New Guinea. And he got the opportunity to come with some missionaries named the Jarrett's to uh, travel here in America. He got to get an education for a couple years at Aurora Christian School. And then Judson College was incredibly generous and allowed him to stay and get his college education here. And during that time, for a couple years, he lived with me and my mom and dad. And he was a wonderful friend. Uh, he worked with me in my catering. And uh, we just had a ball together. He uh, got married some years ago, made his way back to New Guinea, and, and has become a community leader and, and, uh, and just a Christ-like follower of Jesus Christ. He has four kids, beautiful family. And just the other day, I got news that my friend, like a brother, while playing soccer, had a massive heart attack and died. Oh my gosh, you got to be kidding me. He's got a family, God. He's serving you. He loves you. There was not a nicer person in the world than Bezo Sagavo. 
He loved you. He loved people. What do you tell his wife? What do you tell his kids? What do you tell his family and friends? I don't know why we suffer. But here's what I do know. Jesus tells us that in this world, we will have trouble. And some of us have somehow interpreted that verse, that in this world, we will have an ever-growing level of comforts. We think this life is going to be easy. We think this life is going to be great. We think this life is going to be grand. And we do so by taking Jesus' words and throwing them to the ground and saying, yeah, I, I deserve comfort and comfortability in my life. And Jesus says, no, you're going to experience trouble. Now, why in the world would God allow his children, allow his church to experience persecution, pain, and sorrow? And here's the reason why. Because quite frankly, God isn't all that interested in your comfort as he is your christ like and he wanted to grow his church and he wanted to deepen his church and he wanted to mature his church and he wanted to make this church more like his son and to do so he was going to allow persecution to come and the people of God to have to bear under that persecution bear under that sorrow so that they might know what it means to rejoice in their sufferings And so God allows this wolf, Saul, out to try to destroy the church. And he tries, and he tries, and he tries, but he doesn't destroy it. He only deepens their resolve. So sometimes we're surprised when we have to suffer. And some of us this morning are suffering. And some of us are struggling with issues. And some of us are wondering and asking God why. And I'm going to tell you, let go of your comfort and hold tight to Christ-likeness. God wants to build your character. God wants to build your commitment. God wants to grow your courage. So let go of the comfort and grab hold of the things that Christ wants you to hold on to. Now there's another surprise that comes. And that is, not only does God call the church to suffer under great persecution, but notice the text tells us, that now it's who they're going to serve. Who are they going to serve? For this time, they were serving their countrymen. They were serving their their, uh, local friends and family. They were ministering to a holy group of people that they saw as the Jewish people. But notice what the text says in verse 4. Now those who were scattered, they get shot out from Jerusalem, and what do they do? They preach the word. What a novel thought. Instead of giving up, instead of, uh, you know, taking down the tent and calling the end of the show, they keep going. They're just relocated. But where are they relocated? Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Now, right away, you say, Samaria. Sounds like a nice place. That's like us going from Sugar Grove to Yorkville. Doesn't sound too bad. Both have Culver's. Both have Aldi's. I mean, uh, Sure Grove could use a movie theater here. We got McDonald's. We've got a lot of the same stuff. They're good people, right? But Samaria was a place that Jewish people hated. It was the other side of the tracks. Samaria was a place where the mixed breeds lived. The mutants. It was a common prayer in Jewish uh, houses that the father and head of the household would pray a prayer, Lord, thank you for not making us a Samaritan family. In fact, the worst thing, and by the way, Samaritans were a mixed breed of Jewish lineage and Assyrian and Babylonian lineage. Now you'd say, how did that happen? During the time when the Jews were in exile in Babylon, during the days of Ezra and Daniel and in times of Nehemiah, during that time of captivity, some Jewish people, quite a few, made a decision to intermarry with the Babylonian Assyrian captors that they had. And so this group was not purebred Jewish anymore. It was this half-breed of Assyrian, Babylonian, and Jewish. 
And I will tell you, one of the worst things in the world that a Jewish individual could have happened is that in your guess who's coming to dinner, a Babylonian or a Syrian came to take your daughter as a bride. I laughed early in the first service. My father-in-law was here, and there's nothing worse than when an Assyrian comes to take your daughter from you. Okay? For those that don't know, I am of Assyrian descent. And you didn't want that. And because of that, Samaritans weren't allowed in Jewish worship. Samaritans weren't allowed to come and pay homage to God. They were God-fearing people. They loved the God just as the Jewish people did. They loved Yahweh. They loved Jehovah. They looked forward to the Messiah. But if you remember in John chapter 4, Jesus is... talking with a Samaritan woman. If you remember, the Samaritan woman is aghast that Jesus is even talking to her. He's amazed that she, or she's amazed that he'll even let her dip some water for him. She's amazed that he'll even talk with her. And Jesus says, well now, where do you worship? Tell me about your faith and all that. And she says, us Samaritans, we worship on a mountain. Why does she say that? Because the Jews said, you will never touch foot in our temple. Don't even think about it. And so, now Jesus has called his disciples, remember, to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Now I wonder if the disciples early on just thought that was a joke. Ha ha, Jesus. But now they're coming to realize that they're being sent that way. Listen, very important. The early disciples would have never reached out to Samaria unless God had caused persecution to take place. It was really, really comfortable to stay in Jerusalem. And so God turns up the heat, and he sends them out to Samaria. And so they start reaching out to Samaritans. But I want you to notice uh, that when they reach out to Samaritans, it goes farther than that. Let's fast forward to verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, he's been in Samaria And God has done a mighty work in Samaria. In fact, before we get to verse 26, notice many, many people come to know Jesus. Many, many spirits are cast out of people. Many, many individuals who are paralyzed or lamed are healed. And there is so much joy in the city, verse 8 says. God's doing a work. But now, Philip is called to go somewhere else. Not just to Samaria, but now to the uttermost parts of the world. He is to head out, rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, where it was a desert. And there, so he's probably in northern Africa at this point. And he arose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of the... uh, royalty of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, for he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And upon returning, seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Let's stop there. The second surprise that comes is not that that God's just going to reach out to the Samaritans, but now he, the circle's going to get even broader. And I want you to recognize, while he is an African, which is an important issue, because the gospel keeps getting spread. Now we're not in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria. Now we are in Africa, Ethiopia, Eastern Africa. There's something even more significant that I see. When we read the Scriptures, I tell you over and over again, the way to study Scriptures is to observe when there are phrases or words that are used over and over and over again. Because what the writer is telling you is this is important. And you would have thought being an Ethiopian would have been important. It is important. It's mentioned twice in the text. But five times we are seen, we see in the text that this man is described as a eunuch. Five times in a few short verses. What is Luke trying to tell us? Well, many of you may not know what a eunuch is. A eunuch is a man who probably, upon uh, the beginning of puberty, was castrated. And because of that, his life would be very, very different. His life would not be that of a normal adolescent or adult male. One writer put it this way. He said the following, imagine you're a child taken from home, 
taken from your parents, taken to another country. Men would hold you down. They operated on you as you lay frozen with fear. You felt the searing pain of castration and suffered a long and arduous recovery. You grew up, but you never experienced puberty. As other boys matured, you did not change in the same ways. You began your work in the royal court, but you deep down longed to find love and have a family, but you were unable. The non-eunuchs in the court, they respected your position, but behind your back you heard the mocks. They envied your elevated status in the palace, but they would jeer you for being less than a man. You felt rejected. You felt alone. You were often sick, and you grew fragile because you lacked the necessary hormones that men need in their bodies. Therefore, your bones grew brittle, and your heart grew bitter. This man was a eunuch. And I want you to know, God calls us, listen, to the Samaritans of our life, those mongrels, those people who we see as less than us, but he also calls us to the scarred individuals of life. And our world is filled with scarred individuals. People who, like this man, have been traumatized, whether at a young age or as an adult. Someone has done something to you and has not only broken your heart, but maybe broken your body or broken your spirit or made you feel less than garbage. Maybe it's through abuse or maybe it's through unfair treatment. Whatever it is, I want you to know this morning that just as God sent Philip on a one-man mission to minister to this man, God too sees you in your pain. God too sees you in your sorrow. Now, as you think about that, Notice the passage that this man is reading. This scarred man is reading. And I think it becomes quite evident of what we see in this man. In verse 32, now the passage of Scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before his shears are silent, so he opens not his mouth. Listen to what Isaiah says. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. I'm speculating, but I think I'm okay in doing so. I think the reason why this man has come to this passage isn't because he did this with the Bible. Hmm, I wonder what God's Word has to say for me. Read. I think he came upon this passage in Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. And I think he sits there and says, I know what it's like to be humiliated. I know what it's like to be treated unjustly. I know what it's like to have my life taken away from me. And so he asked the question, who is this man? Someone tell me who this man is because I'm a broken individual. I'm a hurting individual. And I want you to know our world today is filled with broken, hurting people. And the cause of the church is to go find them and give them hope and give them peace and show them love and care for them. We are called to serve the Samaritans of the world and we are called to serve those who are scarred. <clears throat> Excuse me. This man was hurting. And God knew it. And God was going to send someone to preach to him. Listen, our world is full of surprises. And being a Christian doesn't mean God doesn't throw curveballs your way. He did the church and he will to us. And the question is, what real you will come out? Notice Philip shows us that when God throws a curveball, we need to be ready and we need to be willing because it's going to demand our faithful service. Who is going to reach this guy? Who is going to reach the Samaritans and the scarred individuals around Philip? Who is going to do so? That's a question we have to ask this morning of each and every one of us. There are hurting, broken Samaritans and Englishmen, white, black, brown, purple, red, yellow, black, and white, right? And they're all hurting, and they're all in need of the gospel. And the question is, who's going to go and preach to them? And a lot of us will say, not I, not I. And we'll come up with all kinds of excuses. But I want you to know, when God throws a curveball, that means we're ready to serve. We're committed to serve. And notice that's what Philip does. Notice he is told by an angel of the Lord, in verse 26, rise and go toward 
the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And notice the five words that come after it. And he rose and went. Praise the Lord. How awesome is that? He's told to do something and he does it. What a novel idea. Now, a couple things that we could uh, bring out that he could have been bringing excuses about. First of all, let's go back to verses 1 through 8. The ministry that Philip has in Samaria is an awesome ministry. People are coming to know Christ. He's healing people. He's exercising demons. He is a household name in Samaria. Everybody loves Philip, even as we'll learn next week, Simon the magician in verse 9, who is viewed in Samaria as a god, has even professed some level of relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a revival breaking out. And now, God, you're going to take me from the revival to a dusty, dirty desert road where there's nobody to be found. Why? Sometimes God wants you to downgrade in your ministry. And if you're used to talking in front of thousands, sometimes God's going to call you to the one. Now I want you to notice, he doesn't tell him what he's supposed to do. You see, a lot of us want God to tell us exactly what to do. But he doesn't. He says, I just want you to go to this place, and I'll tell you later what I want you to do. And he's faithful in doing so. And also recognize that Philip has schedules and is busy just like us. Philip could have said what many of us say. I've got nine hours of Netflix tonight to get to. I'm a busy man. I've got video games. I've got hobbies. But Philip goes. And he does what he's asked. How does he do that? What causes him to do that? Three things very quickly. Number one, assurance. He has a confidence now here's the crazy thing. Philip goes and is serving God, whether in Samaria or to this scarred Ethiopian, and he does so, but let us not forget what he's doing this on the heels of. He's just watched one of the other seven men that was given the job of taking care of the widows in Acts chapter 6, Stephen, his friend, his co-laborer for the gospel, he's just seen him get cut down. He watched him die. And he picks up the mantle, and he gets back to work, and he does the very thing that God, his friend, killed. And he knows that the next person I share the good news with might cause a mob to break out, and they may pick up stones and kill me. But he does it. Because he's confident that whatever God puts in front of him, God will be faithful to the end. You see, at church, and I put myself in the boat with you, at church, we're really, really confident. I mean, we might even utter an amen. We may hold up our hands during worship. We got all the confidence in the world, but we go out in the world and we become timid. We get scared. And there's good reason to, I guess. Our comfortability is an important thing. But I'm here to promise you something. And I think I'm pretty good in promising this. If you go out and are bold for your faith, and you do so in these 50 states of the United States of America, I'm going to guarantee you something. I'll see you next week. You're probably not going to die. Right? When was the last time we heard someone die for the gospel? But you may get laughed at. People may mock you. People may say hurtful things about you, but you're not going to die. Philip had the death sentence before him. He knew that the next person he shared the gospel with could have killed him, and he goes out and does it because he has a courage. Whether living or dying, I'm in good hands with God. Amen? And so we need to have that courage. Number two, we need to be available. He had an availability to him. God, I'm willing to go. So what, I got this great ministry going. So what, I got all these plans and purposes in my life that I thought were important. God, I'll go. I'll go to the dusty road you've asked me to. I won't delay. I'll go right away. And I'm going to clear my schedule. I'm going to clear my, my uh, deck of my life so that I am ready and open-handed to do with you will what you will with me. So he's assured. He's available. And notice he had to carry a level of aptitude. So he meets up with this guy. And the Bible says in verse 29 that the Spirit tells him, he sees this guy, 
in the chariot. And he says, I want you to go over and join this chariot. Verse 30, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked, do you understand what you are reading? And the Ethiopian said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture he was reading, we've read already, and notice verse 34, and the eunuch said to Philip, and whom I ask, does the prophet say this about, himself or someone else? Then Philip, verse 35, opened his mouth and began, and beginning with this very scripture, told him the good news about Jesus. You got to be able to know some things if you're going to share the gospel. And Philip takes what he has in front of him, and he says, listen, let me tell you the rest of the story. Let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus is the suffering servant. And for some of us, maybe you don't know enough of the gospel. Maybe you've believed the gospel, but you're like, I don't know how to articulate the gospel. And if that's where it's at, man, I want you to know if you've been here for a while and you're unable to articulate the gospel, it's not your fault, it's our fault. Because we haven't done a good job in teaching you, and we want to teach you what that is. And and sharing the gospel is quite simple. It's communicating that God is holy. It's communicating that all the world, including ourselves, are sinful. And that sinful man cannot have relationship or fellowship with a holy God unless someone comes in and serves in the gap. And that was Jesus who came, being God, made himself flesh that he could put on yours and my sin on the cross of Calvary. And because of the blood that was shed there by faith and repentance, we can trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And in doing so, we might have eternal life. Maybe you don't know how to do that. And I take responsibility as your pastor that we haven't done a good job with that. But for many of us, we say we just need more training. If I only had more training, well, listen, the next step of training you need, you know all of that. The training you need to understand is go. Go do it. Go be bold. Pray for courage. He had an aptitude to share from the Scriptures what it means to be a Christ follower. We need to as well. And he does. He shares the good news. Now notice, and this was where we'll just hit the deck real fast, it allows us our assurance and our availability and this aptitude that sharing the good news provides us a fantastic situation. So he's gone and he's been obedient and get get notice what he gets to do first he gets to proclaim the good news the good news the euangelion in the greek the good news now listen he doesn't say i get to proclaim the good news of jesus i think philip was excited i get to share the good news with jesus listen there should be an excitement in every one of our hearts to go to work tomorrow for no other reason than this to share the good news of jesus christ with our co-workers I get to do that. I get the privilege of sitting in a a mindless cubicle that God has forced all the other people in the corporate workplace that I'm at to be able to hear that I love Jesus. I get to do that. I get paid for opportunities to share Jesus with my coworkers. I get because my parents tell me to. I get to go to school, learn a couple things, and tell my friends about Jesus. What an opportunity. We carry in jars of clay great treasure, the Bible says. We have, the Bible says, a pearl of great price, a valuable token of which we get to be as Christ's ambassadors the ability to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. And when we do, notice we get to participate in God's grace. Notice the text goes on and it says that the Philip shares and it says that they're going along, verse 36, along the road and they come to some water and the eunuch says, here, see, is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip commands the, the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water and Philip and the eunuch were baptized. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord then carries Philip off, which we'll get to in a moment. Philip gets the opportunity to participate. Notice three different times in the text, they, they, they. They got out of the chariot, they went down into the water, and he baptized the Ethiopian. One guy is going through it personally. The other guy gets to see it and be a, a, an observer, a spectator of it. Listen, earlier this morning, 
I think I had the greatest highlight I've had in my 15 years of ministry at this church. In this pool of water behind me, I got to baptize my oldest son. And here's the crazy thing. I got to be a participant in God's grace because I've watched my son grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and without prompting him, without begging him, without demanding of him to get baptized. In this last year, God has done a work in that young man's life and he came to us and he said, I want to be baptized. And I got to participate in it. And listen, we just got to participate in baptisms. We got to see people's life change and that should ignite our hearts. We're a part of something God is doing, and we get to see people's lives change, and that's why God calls us to evangelism, not just to take us out of our comfort zone, but the great joy that comes when we see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And here's the crazy thing. Studies tell us that the majority of Christians will never in their lifetime lead someone to the Lord. Can I tell you something? I'm not going to guilt you in any way, shape, or form. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You are missing out. Oh my gosh. What an opportunity to be able to be one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Oh my gosh. The joy that fills your heart if you have ever led someone to the Lord. It will rock your world. So you're missing out. Participate in God's grace. Is it scary? Yes. Is it awkward? Yes. Do you make mistakes? I do all the time. But it's an awesome thrill to be a part of. Notice finally, you get a preview of God's glory. So I don't know what happens here. Almost every week in these last weeks, there's been a part of the scripture that I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. And so Philip shares the good news of Jesus Christ. He baptizes him, and then all of a sudden he's gone. Now, I don't know if Luke's saying he's just really fast and ran out of the water and was never to be seen again, but a lot of people believe that he was somehow teleported from this place to this Azotus place that's mentioned at the end of our passage. So there's this teleportation that takes place. Now, why he was teleported, I don't know. Why we're not teleported, I have been on the Eisenhower Expressway and wish I'd been teleported lots of times. So I don't know. But here's what I can tell you. If that's the case, there was a preview for Philip because the great and blessed hope of the believer is in a twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. And Philip experienced that, which is awesome. But less than being teleported, how do we experience a preview of the glory of God? We are never told that Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch ever meet up again. But I'll tell you where they will. Glory. And they're gonna, they are in heaven right now. And they're experiencing the glory of God and the mercy of God and the love of God apart from the presence of sin. And I will tell you what a joy it will be. We may lead people to the Lord and they may never know. They may never know. I don't think the Sunday school teacher at the church I grew up in knows the impact that she had on my life. I don't think she knows that today, I mean, she does from glory, right? She knows a lot now. But she would have never known here on earth the impact. Many of the people who have had impacts in my life, I've been too rude to tell them, right? I haven't told them the, the job they've done. But now in glory, they know it. And they're seeing it. And one day we will stand in glory and we will have the opportunity to see people that we had massive parts in their lives. It may have been short, but little do we know the impact that we've had. When we share the good news of Jesus, we preview what's going to take place in glory. So God's throwing you some curveballs. God wants you to be Christ-like. God wants you to be available. God wants you to be faithful. Will the real you rise up and in commitment and love follow Jesus along the way, even if it means going to people that you didn't think you were called to? Or will you cower in fear and say, you know what, it's too hard. I pray we'll follow the footsteps of Philip and we'll obey the calling the gospel has in our lives. Not because we have to, but because we get to. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for this time in your word. I thank you, Lord, for the patience of your people to sit under this teaching. I pray that you would allow them to glean truths from it. 
so that they might uh, better serve you, that they might better experience your blessing as they trust and obey you every step of the way. So Lord, send us forth from this place, reminding us as you did of your disciples that the fields are white with harvest, that there are people out there who are questioning and wondering about this God, wondering about this Jesus of whom we celebrate his birth on the 25th. As they hear songs, as they see symbols of of this Jesus who came and died, Lord, I pray we would use this Christmas season as an opportunity to share your good news and that you might allow us to experience the blessing it is to see people called out of darkness and brought into your marvelous light. Give us the courage and power us by your Holy Spirit so that we can be equal to the task, so that you might receive glory and so that we might receive the good you want for us. Now send us forth, Lord, now in fellowship out into a world that we might be bold and courageous. We love you and we thank you for this example this morning from Acts chapter 8 and commit to you our desire to live it out. In Christ's name we pray and all God's people said, Amen.